Welcome to the e Shala for PG students. The subject is architecture. The paper that we're going to discuss is urban design. And the module in particular is on technology and urban design. Welcome to session one, part one. Session one describes the relationship between civilization and technology and everything that makes us a civilization and all of the technology we require to make civilization. Welcome to the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is the age of us. It's the emergence of us as a species that dominates the planet. And we have over the last 100,000 years managed to shape the planet to an extent that no other species before us has done. And we have impacted our environment and the, and the ethos of the planet to a scale that's never been seen in any other species before. So let's talk about how we emerged, or rather what the emergence of ourselves has led to. We as a species have generally formed cultures and civilizations, but what are they? Essentially, all of civilization and all of culture is essentially a group of political structures as well as social hierarchies. There are generally four categories of these as described by a number of anthropologists. The first being the hunter-gatherer bands, which are essentially egalitarian societies that allow a free interaction of, of the members, but they're culturally not that advanced. We then have agricultural or pastoral societies, which, is a, which are essentially create uh, create societies where there are landowners and there are workers who work the land which are, which are culturally a little bit more advanced but not as uh, uh, but not as advanced as the others such as chiefdoms or kingdoms as we call them which have extremely rigid and extremely well documented structures such as king, nobleman, uh, freemen, gentry, serf and so on. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we have this concept of civilization. Now, civilization is something that is extremely complex. And the fact that we give it that very exalted sense is because we form these extremely complex structures that we call civilizations. And at the foundation of these are strictly and very well-organized governments. But what is civilization? Now, this is a definition of civilization that essentially talks about, that generally refers to state policies which combine a basic institution, have a ceremonial center, such as a place where government or cultural activities take place, and where economic activity can happen. The third is a system of writing which is essential or a system of essentially communication between people. But the fourth component and perhaps the most important is a civilization needs a city for all of the other components to exist. And therefore, whenever we speak of civilization, we are talking essentially about a phenomena that is facilitated by urbanism, urban design and urban planning. And civilization allows us to do great and enormous things at a scale at which we never can in any other form of living, such as the hunter-gatherer bands or the kingdoms or the, or the agricultural societies that we have described earlier. But what allows civilization to exist? What allows us to build these immense and complex hierarchies and objects and entities that dominate the planet, that allow, the plan that allow us to call the last 100,000 years the age of man? The answer is technology. But technology, not just in the sense of your cell phones or your computers, but technology as a means of facilitating an objective, as a technology as a way of using 
the things we have to do the things we want. And that has been, that is at the core of the civilizational enterprise. Let's talk about one of the first and perhaps the most important uh, technological tools that we have developed and that's language. Language has allowed us as a species to essentially take the information we have and pass it on to the generations that follow. It allows us to essentially take our knowledge and make it almost immortal and thereby what we've done and thereby what we're doing is we're making our we're making our uh, treasure trove of knowledge larger generation after generation after generation this is despite the fact that a number of languages are dying this is a disk uh, from the rosetta project that we've uh, from the longna foundation this is a number of scientists like uh, like the one you see on your screen has allowed for uh, have made the claim that it's because we have gotten better at, at codifying information at transmitting information and adding to information that we as a species have actually grown more and more and more intelligent as the years go on and this has been proven repeatedly when we look at IQ scores over generations and how each generation seems to be doing better at its uh, uh, in terms of their IQ scores than the generation before it. Let's look at the first steps of civilization. Let's go back 50,000 years uh, to the Upper Paleolithic Revolution as it's called. It's about it's at this time that we started to use fire which is a fundamental technology that's at the foundation of our culture. We started to improve on the tools that we that we had earlier and these are stone tools hence the word paleolithic and around 20,000 years ago we started to go beyond just uh, just our fire uh, hunting and our basic requirements and then started to move to actually creating something and this you can see in this cave painting which is a, essentially an expression of our of our yearning to create something new and this is the beginning of art and eventually the beginning of, uh, of architecture itself. The Great Paleolithic Revolution also allowed us to create, to become essentially modern as we understand it today. We started to think, we started to plan, we started to rely on our brains rather than our brawn to, uh, to arrive at solutions and improve the world uh, around us. 10,000 years ago, we did something even bigger. And this is called the Neolithic Revolution. And the, me, the reason that this is one of the most important periods in human history is because this is when we started to do agriculture on an enormous scale. And we started, and agriculture for the first time allowed us to root ourselves to a particular place and before that if as long as we were hunters we could hunt anywhere but we started to grow things we needed a piece of land and when you have to cultivate a piece of land you have to live with the land and that is the bill that is the beginning of settlement that's the beginning of architecture and it's also the beginning of urbanism as we uh, at its nascent stage Agriculture isn't something that just uh, happens in one part of the world. It's something that begins in a particular uh, part of the world, the fertile crescent of uh, uh, starting from the Nile Valley all the way down to the Tigris and Euphrates all around the, from the Mediterranean Sea to the uh, Persian Gulf. It also begins in China. It also begins in North and South and, and Central America. And this allows us to essentially explored as a species and for the first time we start to shape our environment to a degree that we've never seen before. We start doing things like pottery which is one of the fundamental aspects of human culture. We use tools to produce things that we can use in daily life. This is a image of an Egyptian potter and this is a 10,000 year old bowl from Japan 
where you can start to see people starting to use their environment and use tools to start to shape their environment through objects. We've, this is the period in which we started to see the wheel and it started to emerge as uh, from 9000 BC and then we start to make improvements to the wheel continuously until it becomes something that's essential to human life. But also from the perspective of architecture and urban design, we also invent the brick. The brick is, if you think about it, the first real artificial building material. It's made from natural material, but it's also its size, its shape, its form uh, is dictated by us, by human beings. We start to create, we start to take this mud that we find all around us and we start to shape it, we start to, we start to make it into shapes and forms that allows the mud to serve us. So in places like Jericho, which is one of the oldest cities in the world, we start to see the emergence of architecture, not just as a cave dwelling, but as something that is artificially created, that is, that is, can be built by man. And we start to see the emergence of cities, uh, or rather cities, or rather human settlements, and we see them emerge in, a, in very simplistic forms, such as the famous uh, circular structures at Jericho, which are from 8000 BC. A few thousand years later, we then start to build the brick in more complex shapes and in more complex forms. And this is an image that we essentially depicts the emergence of rectangular buildings which allows, uh, which makes far more efficient use of the brick and also allows us to use the space better and allows us to build cities or rather settlements that are a little bit more, uh, that are a little bit more useful compared to the earlier uh, buildings and structures and settlements that, e that existed before. By 7000 BC, we see the emergence of civilization in its in the senses that we are start to understand and the key to civilizations is cities this is a mehergar civilization which is a precursor to the harappan civilization prehistoric northwest india currently in pakistan and you can start to see that that people are no longer happy just building their houses or their little villages they're starting to expand they're starting to work together to build something more than just their own house or their own bricks. And they're starting to collect these bricks and collect these houses and start to build cities. And therein begins the phenomena of urbanism and urban design. Let's jump a few thousand years. And then for the first time, we start to see metallurgy becoming prominent. We start to see our ability to take metals, melt them and mix them together and make something stronger. And that is the beginning of the Bronze Age, about 3500 BC. And at that time, we then invent axes made of metal. And these axes can now clear forests to an immense degree compared to uh, compared to the uh, stone axes that we used to use earlier. And so, as a consequence, our cities can now be bigger, physically bigger, and that allows them to grow and spread to a, second, to a degree that we've never been able to do before that time. The Bronze Age is also an age of great movement of people. And we see the Egyptians and the residents of the Indus Valley travel up and down their navigable rivers and even sail across the sea and start to trade with one another and start to exchange goods and start to exchange cultures as well. And we see that this movement is not just based in one place, but this movement happens all over the world. And people start to then exchange ideas and exchange thoughts and cities allow them to do this and cities are the crucial infrastructure that allows this great movement of people all across the world to happen. And that 
both as a consequence and as a reason leads to the emergence of the great river valley cities that we see happen throughout the world and especially in the Nile Valley in Mesopotamia which consists of a number of smaller nations if you will like Sumeria and Assyria and the Hittites and, and a number of other uh, civilizations. We have the great Indus Valley civilization which is which was perhaps the most advanced of these and we also have the emergence of civilization in China along the Huangho and Yangtze rivers. Let's first talk one of these which is Sumeria and look at its uh, contribution to both technology and urban design and see how the two are interrelated. The Sumerians were as uh, discussed earlier contributed to language whose importance we've discussed earlier as a means of transmitting knowledge through time and the fact that the Sumerians invented writing and created a system where they could translate their thoughts from one generation to the next to the next until the end of uh, their civilization allowed them to grow and they were one of the most powerful and perhaps the most important of the Mesopotamian kingdoms. They also happened to invent monetary transaction through currency which is another important development when you look at the, the sense of trade because we because a currency would allow people to trade easier and would fix a value to, uh, to goods which was something that wasn't available before uh, through uh, which wasn't available to people through the barter system that they used earlier. They also made the wheel and the axle prominent, the wheel which was always there but the axle allows the vehicle to move faster and therefore goods and services could move faster throughout the Sumerian uh, kingdom compared to the speed at which they could do it earlier. And this leads to the development of cities like Ur which is one of the earliest cities and perhaps one of uh, perhaps the oldest city perhaps the oldest city in the world and also Uruk which was an even larger city in uh, Mesopotamia and we see that they start not only to use this technology that they're inventing but they're also starting to use cities as laboratories for this technology to emerge and also as users of this technology as time goes by. Let's start to look at specific technology that a few of these civilizations have developed and how it's shaped their growth. The Indus Valley civilization used water incredibly well. They invented the sailboat or they invented or rather than the sailboat they invented they invented uh, married, uh, water navigation. So essentially goods and people were moving up and down the Indus river and all of those other rivers in the in that system. But they were essentially experts at water management. You can see they had a system at Lothal which could supply water and at the same time could actually collect wastewater and, uh, and uh, sullage and sewage as well. And this led to their civilization becoming something that was large and, and great because simply because they could use a, a precious resource like water which was the basis of their uh, growth as a civilization but at the same time they could also use it in a very strict urban sense which is something that we are still trying to do today in a number of Indian cities. They, they built these immense structures uh, that we now call baths which were reservoirs that collected water and allowed the community to meet and, by, and they've used these resources in a way that brings people together something that we would still do in India thousands, thousands of years later with our great step wells in Gujarat and uh, and most of northern and western India. So there is that legacy, there is that memory of that marries both technology and urban design deep within our cultural memory and this leads to this great civilization which by far the most urban civilization among these river valleys and creates a very complex and very advanced way of, uh, of living and a standard of life that we have in some aspects never really lived up to in the centuries that followed. There are other inventions as well which allow us to different civilizations to do different things. One of these is the ramp. If you remember Archimedes simple machines and it's a fundamental machine that allowed a number of things to happen and one of the things that 
were possible because of the ram are the pyramids of Egypt, which used rams essentially to build, which uh, used rams to essentially build the pyramid step by step by step and allowed the pyramids themselves to become this great artifact of human history and remains a symbol for the Egyptian civilization thousands and thousands of years after it died. But the Egyptians were, weren't just great architects and engineers, they were also great urban designers. This is the plan of Memphis, which is the capital of the of Pharaonic Egypt for thousands of years. And Memphis was along, was built along a river and it was, and this reconstruction of Memphis ex essentially shows you how grand the city was. And keep in mind that this is about 3500 uh, BC and the scale of the city and the size of the city allows that civilization to exist. This is where people come to learn, this is where people come to trade and this is where people come to sell their produce and to buy from each other and this is where people come to create essentially what we know as culture today. In part one we have looked at a number of different civilizations and we'll be looking at a few more in part two. But what we've tried to lay down is what makes these what makes technology work as a facilitator for civilization and what makes cities work as facilitators as facilitators for civilization there is this deep and powerful link in these societies and in these civilizations in these cities and also in these technologies that allows this to happen if you look at any of these different uh, errors in human history that we've spoken about, at every step you will find that we have moved in a particular direction and the direction has almost always been forward. The reason being that we as a species have somehow been more creative with what we do and more engaged with how we with how we create things compared to other species and especially perhaps other primates and perhaps other uh, other uh, intelligent mammals in the world such as dolphins. It is this fundamental drive towards civilization, this fundamental urge that we seek to expand, to rise above that drives us perhaps in positive ways and perhaps not in positive ways. And if you looked at the intervention of the axe, the emergence of the axe as, as a driver for civilization that allowed a number of these river valley civilizations to expand. And if you look at which could be perhaps the start of our, of our engagement with nature that hasn't been that positive over the last few hundred years. But then if you look at something like our emphasis on sailing, the way in which uh, and the way in which a number of the, uh, the way in which the Egyptians, the Indus Valley residents and a number of these other uh, residents, uh, citizens of these, uh, of these cities traveled up and down their rivers and, and also traveled among themselves allows for the human experience to be enlarged allows us to build a, to build cultures allows us to build uh, to exchange ideas on a scale that has never really been seen before the emergence of civilization and we keep returning to this idea of civilization again and again and again because every aspect of our lives or every aspect of our history is dominated by this need to be civilized and that is at the core of what we do as a species and technology allows us to do that and cities allow civilization to exist in the sense that they are the they are the theater they are the arena and the and just the examples of what civilizations are. And this is the essence of who we are as a species and who and what 
and explains essentially once again why this particular error has been described as the Anthropocene or the age of man. Thank you.